great pleasure for me to be here in Ireland, and uh, I think it's an interesting time for the Euro right now, but it's like in medicine, if a doctor tells you that you are an interesting case, uh, it's, it's, not, <laughs> it's not a sign that your health is in very good shape. <laughs> I think so that's, that's maybe the same thing with the Euro, so it's interesting, but uh, I think the situation is really, really difficult, and I think after the events of uh, this weekend, it has become even more difficult. So uh, I think the best uh, is to give you a certain overview of how I see the situation right now. And uh, like on, on cigarettes, I have to also to, to add a kind of warning sign. This so my position is not a typical German position. So don't don't uh, don't take it as as, a, as the German view on these on these uh, topics. And I also want to say so I'm member of the German Council of Economic uh, Experts. And it's important to know that this is an independent advisory body. It's not like the uh, Council of Economic Advisors in the United States, which is, which is a part of the administration. So we are um, nominated by the government, but we are completely independent in our reports and everything. So otherwise, I couldn't talk here as, <laughs> as I do. And, but I think it's important to know, to, to, to understand how this, how this council is working. Okay, so what I want to do in these 20, 25 minutes is, is to, to discuss with you the main misperceptions or pitfalls uh, in the management of the euro crisis. And I think it's, it's obvious that something has gone wrong because now we are in the fourth, yeah, the fourth year of the crisis. It's, it started somewhere in 2010 and now we're 2013, so we're entering the fourth year of the crisis. And uh, I haven't seen... Uh, yeah, so it's real... And, and, and so far, I haven't, I don't, don't have the impression that things are really getting better, and so something must be wrong in this in this crisis. So if, if you are with a doctor and mm -hmm. and he's treating you for three years and and you have, your health is going worse and worse, you would also ask, is it really uh, the best doctor? Or maybe should I should I should I take another one? So what what are the main? <laughs> is it is it okay? Is it, it can, can, okay? So. What are the main, the main uh, misperceptions, pitfalls? I think um, one of the uh, misperceptions of the last uh, yeah, almost nine months was the worst is over. Yeah, so after Draghi had announced uh, he will do whatever it takes to save the euro, uh, we have seen uh, that the risk premia have come down, that uh, the bond markets have stabilized. And, I, and many people thought now uh, it's, it's, it's getting better. We see the light at the end of the tunnel. And uh, so we can relax and, and, and things will really, will really turn to the better. Uh, in my view, this was always a misperception because um, the situation in bond markets is certainly important for the euro area. But the problems are much more deep-seated. And I think the way to describe it this is kind of a uh, vicious circle or vicious triangle of, of the euro area. We have three interrelated areas uh, with, with, uh, which, 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 which are causing problems. I think it started with the banking crisis, especially in this country, and this banking crisis led to a crisis of public finances because the government uh, was, was taking the responsibility for, for banking, for, for bank debt, and, uh, and the need now, and the need uh, to, to reduce deficits in a relatively short period of time uh, uh, turned the whole thing also into a macroeconomic crisis. And these three crises, three, three dimensions of the crisis are, uh, uh, are, intensify, are, are intensifying each, each, each other mutually. The, the world, if the economic situation gets worse, if the recession uh, gets, gets stronger, then of course the situation in the banks uh, gets worse. If the situation of the public finances is deteriorating, then of course the situation of the banks get worse because they are holding all the bank, the government bonds. And uh, if the macroeconomic crisis also has, has a negative impact on, on public finances. And so uh, what, what, Draghi, uh, what Draghi did, in my view, did not very much to change this, this uh, setup of the problem. So it, the stabilization of the bond markets was maybe a good thing a uh, little bit for the, for the banks. It helped a little bit the banks. Uh, for public finances, it, it had only very marginal effect for the new. If, if, if governments were issuing new uh, debt, they got it a little bit cheaper. But the overall problem uh, was, was, not really, was not really changed by, by this, this intervention uh, of Draghi. And, and um, 
if, if you look at these three areas, macroeconomic crisis, finance, public finances, banking crisis, what one could see even now before uh, the, the situation of last week and this Cyprus crisis is that the real economy uh, was going to deteriorate in this year. So we, we, in all the major problem countries, with the exception of Ireland, uh, the recession that started last year it was clear it will continue this year. Uh, the unemployment, which increased last year, it was also clear that it would also increase next year, this year. So it was clear the macroeconomic crisis would not, would not stop, the macroeconomic crisis would continue. The euro area itself was already in a recession last year, and it will remain in a recession this year. So that was, it was clear to me that, uh, in, that this part, this is, is, is part of the, of the overall crisis, that no, no improvement is in sight. And as far as the, the crisis of public finances is concerned, it is also, was also clear that uh, in spite of austerity policies, the, jet to, the debt to GDP uh, ratios would increase. Uh, I have this data for 2012 and 2014 for almost all countries. It was clear uh, the, the government debt will increase. So the, the crisis of public finance, there was no, no, no um, it was clear that, that this crisis of, of public finances uh, would, not, would not be ended. And the third uh, 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 dimension of the problem, uh, the, the banking crisis, if you look at, at bank lending in the uh, in, in euro area countries, you could see that uh, until now, the stabilization of bond markets, the stabilization of the financial system in general did not have a real impact on uh, bank lending, you can see that, that this kind of deleveraging continues, that they have negative, negative growth rates of bank lending uh, in all the, all the problem countries. So also on this account, uh, the crisis of the banking system, no uh, real improvement was in sight. It's interesting to look at these data uh, because they have the growth rates for bank lending also in the boom years. If you look here in Ireland, you had growth rates of more than 20, almost 30 percent. Uh, if you're Spain, 25% Greece, all the more than 20. So in retrospect, it's just, just as an aside, it's interesting that the smart people of the ECB, that nobody looked at these charts because these data were publicly available. And, and I think if you have a big institution like the ECB with so many smart researchers who write so many uh, sophisticated research papers, why that, that not even one took the time to say, well, maybe something's wrong here. That's also, in retrospect, it's interesting if you look at it, nobody realized it. And it's also interesting that, that uh, people who were uh, chief, uh, the people who were the chief economist of the ECB in these years uh, are now running around uh, criticizing governments and, and all other, and many other people, and not uh, feeling responsible for not having realized, for not realizing what, what's to, what, what was happening there. So, <coughs> The, the first, I think, the very dangerous misperception of the last few months was the burst is over because it, it has led to a kind of passive attitude of the governments. Uh, also in Germany, there was no feeling that one has to use this time. Of course, it was, was some kind of breathing space that was provided by Draghi's remarks. So the situation in markets has, has, has become more stable, and that would have been a good chance somehow to improve the situation to think about institutional changes, other things, but this time was not really used. It was just, they said, well, it's now to rise over. There's not very much we have to do. So uh, now I think that's, that was kind of the, the crisis in Cyprus was now the wake up call. Uh, maybe also elections in Italy was the first wake up call. And now the crisis in Cyprus, the second wake up call. The crisis is not over, not yet over. We are in the middle of the crisis. And we didn't, did not use the time that was provided, the last nine months to do anything to improve it. Now, the situation, we are really in the middle of this, of this, of this crisis. And as I said, uh, the real economy uh, is in recession and is, is a strong recession uh, in, in many countries. Uh, government debt will increase and, um, and bank, bank situation of banks uh, has, has also not, not improved. So what, what went wrong? And these are, in my view, these, these are these, these pitfalls. I think one of the main problems was that the fiscal consolidation was excessive. 
in, in the euro area. And, it, and, and you can see it if you compare the euro area with the United States. Um, and um, you can say the United States is a perfect monetary union. They've done all the structural reforms. It couldn't be better. Yeah? But nevertheless, if you compare the euro area and the United States, you can see that the US needed a very strong fiscal impact to keep their uh, economy going, to get the unemployment down, and that they really use this, uh, the, the fiscal instrument, uh, to, to maintain uh, the momentum of their economy. And I think it's completely different, if you look at the fiscal balance, a completely different approach in the US than the euro area. They had very, very strong fiscal deficits. They maintained it for quite a long time. And I think the, the outcome is quite surprising. Well, it's quite, quite obvious. No, it's not surprising, it's obvious. Yeah, so really, un, it's obvious. So really, the, they, they, they both had almost 10% unemployment here in, in 2010, and now the US are, are below, um, below eight in the euro area. It is, it, is, um, it is approaching 12, and maybe we'll continue. I really think it's important to make this comparison, because the US have everything that we are longing for in, in the euro area. They're really completely in the optimal currency area and all the structural reform, everything flexible, wonderful. Nevertheless, they were needing, they, they needed a lot of fiscal stimulus to keep the economy going. And I think it's really important to have that in mind. If it were the other way around, that, that the US would have been able with these euro area deficits to keep their economy go going at 2% uh, growth rate. And the, this, uh, the blue, uh, bar is, 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 was the euro area deficit. Then we could say, well, they, now you can see the effect of structural reforms and, and, and it's much better. But it's the other way around. So even the US needed so much fiscal stimulus and I think it was the right strategy because um, the, the crisis, the, they had the same crisis more or less in the euro area. They had a, they had a real estate crisis, they had a financial uh, crisis of the financial system. And I think their approach was that to give the private sector time to recover, to, to uh, reduce their debt, to repair their balances, giving time to the real estate market uh, to, 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 to stabilize. But I think that was, that was a much more sensible approach. And the question is that if, if I say that in Germany, people are of course, are of course uh, shocked and say, how can you, I, can you say we need more debt to solve the problems of debt? This is completely wrong and, and how, how can you do that? And this was, really dangerous to, to, to make such statements in Germany. But the answer is, um, it's not that we are trying to therapy debt with debt, what most people say, but we are trying to therapy excessive savings with excessive debt. Because if, if we, in the global economy, in the last few years, if you have excessive uh, public debt or very high public sector deficits, of course, it's logical uh, that uh, the, and on the other side, there must be excessive private saving. Uh, that's pure bookkeeping logic. If pu uh, public deficits are extremely high, then the private sector uh, financial balances must, must, extreme, must also be extremely high. And that's what you can see. Here in the global economy, these are the financial savings, the financial balances of the private sector uh, in, the last, in, in, in the last 15 years. And you could see, well, there was a period until 2007, where there were some countries having high financial, private financial savings, there were countries with some um, with, with, uh, uh, financial deficits, but it has turned around and the whole global economy is now characterized by huge private financial savings. And so what we are doing with the deficits we are, is a therapy to excessive uh, private financial savings. And that's in a quite different story. So we are not, not curing debt with debt, but we are curing uh, excessive savings with uh, high uh, uh, public deficits. So I think that's, that's really something important to have in mind because most people overlook that, look this, but it's of course only the other side of the same metal. Yeah? So it's, it's the same thing. And, and so in my view, the, the US approach was a much, much better approach. Uh, of course, in the Euro area, we did not have this alternative because each country had to try to fight on its own, and they, all the countries came under a strong pressure of financial, the problem countries came under a strong pressure of financial markets, so they did not have the comfortable position of the United States, okay, 
we just keep our deficits high and we in, if necessary we finance it with our central bank and, and so we don't have to care about financial markets. So that's of course the, the, the opt as, as each country in the euro area had to, had, had to fight on its own, um, this option was simply not available. And so of course uh, what was adopted was severe uh, in, in so-called problem countries were severe austerity policies and, uh, and these austerity policies uh, were uh, lead us to a third misperception or, or pitfall is that uh, the fiscal policy multipliers were very much uh, underestimated. I think it's interesting to see that here for Greece, maybe I have to explain a little bit um, the chart. Um, <clears throat> In 2010, these are the forecasts of the uh, EU Commission for Greece. In 2010, they thought in 2011, uh, the GDP in Greece would decline by half, half a percent. Then they made the next forecast in 2010, uh, 2011, and then they said, well, it will be three point something. Then in 2012, they made the forecast for 2011, then they realized what it, what it really was. In 2011, it was minus seven. Yeah, and well, the, e the European Commission is in charge with the Troika with all these programs, and it shows, and, and, and more or less, they did increase what they were told, especially in, in the first years, and so obviously uh, the, the multipliers were, were grossly underestimated. It's funny that, that the ECB is now, and also our German finance ministry say it's wrong, uh, the multipliers were not, uh, were not underestimated, but if I look at the situation of Italy or Spain, which are all in a, in a, uh, in, in a strong recession, I, uh, it's, it's difficult for me to, to, to see why. <coughs> so so obviously, obviously the multipliers are much stronger than, than, than people expected. And you can obviously you could do the same exercise for other countries. The commission very much uh, overestimated growth rates, which means they underestimated uh, the multipliers. And I think Greece is really a shocking, a shocking example if you see how much uh, how wrong uh, these, these forecasts uh, were. Okay, so that's the third misperception, and it's, it's a little bit related to the fourth misperception. That is that if you, do, if you consolidate, you mainly do it via uh, expenditure cuts and not via uh, increased revenues. This is from the OECD, and it shows expenditure plans for 2013 and 14. Um, it's from the OECD Economic Outlook. The red, uh, red means spending cuts, and the blue is, uh, high, is, is uh, increases in revenues. And you can see it's very much biased towards expenditure cuts. And I think that also explains the high multipliers, because expenditure cuts have a higher multiplier than increases in revenues. And it also, of course, explains uh, that uh, the, the political uh, resistance is growing, because uh, expenditure cuts, of course, are more hitting the poorer people uh, than, than increases in, um, uh, in, in revenues. And, but that's probably, it's, it's mainly the, so I think you can also have the charts later on if you, if you, if you, if you want, from the, so the, probably not everybody can see them very clearly. Um, but, but that explains also very, very much the resistance of, of, many, pe of, of, of many citizens. And, uh, and if, you, if you really see the crisis as a crisis that was caused by financial markets, it's also not clear why the, the mistakes by the financial markets uh, have to be financed by, by average people, by people with low incomes, why they should be uh, responsible for what, what went wrong in, in, in financial markets. They were not very much profiting from the boom and now they have to pay the bill. I think that's also, I think the, 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 the public uh, resistance and the protests are also really warranted. So the next, uh, the, 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 another misperception is who has to adjust? And, and we have, uh, as, 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 a, as an additional problem, we have the problem of competitiveness um, in, in, in several countries. And these competitiveness problems have also to do something with Germany. Um, because also uh, we were one of the strongest economies of the euro area, we were pursuing in the first half of the last decade a very uh, 
restrictive wage policy, wage moderation as we called it, was kind of a mercantilist approach saying we want to become more competitive and, and uh, we, we, we want to boost our exports at any price, which means that for a long period of time our unit labor costs in Germany were almost stagnant. Yeah? And of, of course, that created problems for the, for the other, it, 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 it had a negative impact on domestic demand in Germany, so the economic growth in Germany was, was relatively low, which, which of course dampened the overall developments in the euro area. Uh, at the same time, in other countries, especially also in Ireland, unit labor costs were increasing much more than warranted by productivity growth. So you cut this gap. Somehow the gap has closed, but not, not totally. There's still some, some difference, especially to compare to Italy um, and, and to Spain. And the question is, who, who has to adjust? I think in your country, a lot of adjustment has taken place. It's something one can see. Uh, I think Ireland is one of the countries where the wage adjustment has, has been very pronounced and strong. I think that also explains why you are doing quite well in terms of exports. I think that's, that's something specific to Ireland. And of course, you're also profiting from the fact that you are a very open economy. So that's, that's the, same, the same strategy is much more difficult to pursue for, it, for, for Greece or, or Spain, which are relatively closed economies traditionally, which have not a very large share of exports. So, of course, you are in a, in a kind of uh, quite positive situation that if, if you reduce wages, the negative impact on domestic demand is more than compensated or, or, or largely compensated by, by stronger export growth. So that's, that's a situation which, which other problem countries don't have. But what is the, the interesting question is what, what can Germany do? And we, for many years, our wages have not been growing sufficiently. They're doing a little bit more. And I've made the proposal in Germany say, well, why not have an additional wage increase this year by two percentage points? It's a kind of positive contribution and, and as, as a kind of adjustment of the surplus countries. I think that's, you know, it's an old, old discussion among economists. I think John Maynard Keynes uh, was very much focusing on this, this topic. Who has to adjust, the surplus country or the deficit country? I think the German approach is, the defi of course, the deficit countries have to adjust. They have made all the mistakes. Why should we adjust? Yeah, it's really, and, and I've, I've just made this proposal to stimulate a little bit discussion. Say, let's have a one-time additional wage increase of two percentage points, which is not huge. But even the German trade unions did not want it. So I was really, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> the head, the head of the of the IG Metall, IG, of the Metal Workers Union, which is the strongest, he was really criticizing me. Yeah? So they said, no, no, why, why? She said, why should we support with our wage policies? Uh, uh, Chinese, uh, the ch Chinese companies. Yeah. And so, so the perception that, that, that we are sitting in the same boat and that the, the, there's a need to adjust and that both sides, the surplus and deficit side, need to adjust, that's not a perception that is very strong in Germany. Yeah. They said, no, why, we, we are, why, should we, why should we get become less competitive? And, and they say, well, if, if, if we are not contributing to the adjustment and if we want all the adjustment to be done in, in countries like France or Spain or Ireland, uh, the deflationary tendencies in these countries will increase. And you get, <coughs> get the problem if, 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 if private sector debt is high, you get a problem that Irving Fisher was, was uh, called, called debt deflation. And I think that's very easy. Irving Fisher said deflation is not such a bad thing. But if, you, if deflation comes after debt has increased heavily, then uh, deflation is, 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 is a disaster. And that's why he calls it debt deflation. Of course, if, if you have high debt and then your wage goes down by 10 or 20%, uh, then, then you really are in trouble. But the perception that some, something has to be done uh, in, in German, that, that we, uh, and, and of, maybe the wage increases are a little bit higher this year, but, but the, overall, the idea that, that we have a responsibility uh, for for the whole uh, union for the whole euro area is not, not very strong. I think the only thing we, we do is if, if it's really burning, if there's an emergency, then we are coming. Yeah. But a kind of but but not we are not the idea is there's not the idea that we need some need to act on a preventive base, doing something to stabilize the system before it's burning up, before before the disaster is there. And so so we are really waiting until the disaster. Then of course as a kind of emergency. Uh, care, uh, we are coming, but that's, I think, not a good solution, neither for, for, for the deficit countries nor for Germany. Okay, then 
we come to another misperception is that's the role of structural reforms. And, and so if, if you ask the, the, the typical uh, Troika economist, what about uh, growth in, in your uh, austerity scenarios? They say, well, growth will come from structural reforms. So that's, that's what really helps, a kind of magic potion uh, that is really helpful. And what, what I find interesting is, is to make, so on this chart, I compare uh, the UK and France. And France. And we all know that the UK has done all structural reforms. It's really all OECD indices for everything. They are really leading in terms of structural reforms. And France, you know, is awful. The government and they have these high uh, government uh, expenditures. 56% of GDP is almost a socialist country. It's terrible. And um, the interesting thing is, if you look at GDP growth rates, France and UK, the last uh, last nine years, they're almost the same. And you could also do the same exercise with export growth and, and kind of foreign uh, trade competitiveness. You wouldn't see a major difference. The only difference is that, just like US, that the fiscal deficit of the, of, of the UK is much higher than France. It's almost twice, this year's almost twice than the deficit in France. Yeah? And so, we can say, even if you, if, 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 uh, a ferry, say, if a ferry could change the, structural, the structures of France into the UK structures overnight, it, it wouldn't, it's not a guarantee that, that, we really, uh, that we will really see much more growth. And so I think these really these structural reforms, I, I wouldn't deny uh, the usefulness of structural reforms, but I think they're really overestimated. If you look at some of the structural reforms, um, I'm not sure whether they're really... Uh, contributing very much to the growth of the economy. Whether the opening time of pharmacies is longer, whether the fees of notaries uh, is reduced, if there's more competition between lawyers, I think that's all things we could say, well, yes, it might, might be useful. But it's, it's maybe like if somebody has a very strong heart attack, you tell him uh, he should brush his teeth more uh, <laughs> carefully and, and take more time. Which, which say it's, it's good, yes, yes, it's, it's helpful, but, but for the heart attack, maybe not, not really. It's not, it's not really uh, the best thing to... Anyhow, so I will have some, some more... I will come, well, I come to the end relatively soon. Another misperception is that um, in order to stabilize the situation on financial markets, there was no willingness, especially in Germany, uh, to discuss any forms of joint and several liability. So our council has made the proposal of a debt redemption fund. The idea is that uh, countries should be allowed to, uh, to uh, tra transfer uh, the public debt that exceeds the 60% debt threshold into joint uh, euro bonds. For, with, with, for, with, for, for, as a bonds with a joint and several liability. And the idea is that this, and, and that would lead to a fund of about 2.6 billion trillion trillion uh, euros. Ireland is not, if we look for Ireland here, when we developed this, we said it's, it's only for countries which are not yet program countries, but that's something one can could, uh, think of. But the idea was we have a common fund, um, and, and these, these bonds that are held in joint and several liability, they have to be repaid in 20 or 25 years, so that after 20 or 25 years, each country has only then its national debt, debt, debt for which it is, is, it is, is liable by itself, and which conforms to 60% uh, criterion of, of, of the Maastricht Treaty. So that was a little bit the idea. So it is a kind of Eurobond scheme, but we don't call it Eurobond, because Eurobond is a terrible word, which <laughs> we should definitely not mention. <laughs> But it's joint with several liability. It's, it's limited in size, government debt exceeding 60%, and it's also limited in duration. It has to be repaid after 20, 25 years. And um, this proposal has, has received a lot of attention um, outside Germany, but in the German public, in German, Germany, the Greens and the SPD have, have shown a lot of sympathy for that proposal. But um, Ms. Merkel, she said, uh, that, uh, that Eurobonds, uh, uh, she, she would not agree in, in her lifetime. So 
that's, that's where we are. But the problem is not having such a mechanism uh, was, was led to a situation where, where this joint and several liability uh, had to be provided by the ECB. Yeah? So that was, uh, so that it's, it's a kind of, of um, yeah, I don't know. So, so it, it, it's not by, not, by not discussing this, the whole responsibility uh, is, is with the ECB. So far it worked, has worked, uh, this drug is announcement, but the question is, uh, what will happen um, if um, this um, period of tranquility will be over, if people will realize <coughs> it's difficult to form a new government in Italy, and if the new government in Italy is not doing exactly what the ECB expects. Uh, because the ECB say, okay, we will all only support a country if it applies for a program, and of course it has to do uh, what, the, what the program envisages, but what happens if, it, if, if an Italian parliament is not um, agreeing to some, I don't know, reform of labor law. So then the ECB say, I, I stop my support, and then uh, risk, uh, is then being confronted with the risk that, that, uh, that Italian bonds uh, will collapse, or what will be happening. And so, and so I think the announcement was helpful, but making it contingent on programs makes it also difficult. So I had more sympathy with the approach of Mr. Trichet, who said simply bought the government bonds. Say, so, okay, there's, there's, we have, we have um, uh, instability, we have, we have disorderly markets. And as a central bank, we have to intervene if markets are not, func are not functioning orderly. Stop, full stop. That's enough. But if you say, we do it only after a program has, has been adopted, you somehow agree, uh, you somehow, somehow say, well, the markets are, doing, are, are functioning well because a program is needed. Yeah? And I, so I think that's very flawed, and so we, I, I think we could, see, uh, we could also see here, see here a problem. Okay, the last one is now uh, what we have seen right now, last weekend, the bail-in of private, of private uh, depositors, and bail-in in general. Uh, in principle, one can say, yes, bail-in is a good thing, it's the principle of a market economy, uh, if you invest your money, if you give your money to, 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 to a bank or to somebody else, you have to ask yourself, is it really uh, a solid institution? Um, that's okay, but, but in, in the current situation, I think bail-ins are very, very dangerous. Because um, if, you are, if you are living in Spain, for instance, you don't have to be a depositor with a Spanish bank. Yeah, so it don't, there's no, no, no need for you to keep your money with the Spanish bank. And if, if now this, the rules of the game will be changed, that bail-ins will be a part of the normal life for bank depositors, then, of course, uh, the behavior of, of depositors will change. And as somebody living in Spain, then I will transfer my money to Germany or to Switzerland or will we'll, 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 uh, exchange it into cash. And so... Bail-ins, in principle, of course, from, from the logic of market economy, it's, it's okay, it's sensible. Yes, people, there, there should be some responsibility, but in the current situation, bail-ins is really playing with the fire. Because if, if live, living in Spain, one asks, well, let's get the money to Germany. That's a good thing with the monetary union. It's, it's, you're completely free to, 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 to transfer your money from one uh, country of the, of the monetary union to another. And if they do that, uh, the Spanish banks who have already lots of problems will get even more problems. And it's really a destabilizing element. And so I think it's extremely dangerous. The question then, of course, remains, but who then will be held responsible for the losses of the banks? And if the losses of banks go beyond the capacity of the government, what can you do? In, in my view, one solution would be to have one-time wealth taxes. So we had that in Germany after the Second World War. It was called Lastenausgleich, equalization of burdens. And after the Second World War, there were some people in Germany who uh, were happy enough to, have, to, to have still have high, high financial wealth. And, and they had to give up 50% uh, of this wealth in a kind of wealth tax over 30 years. So the inflation helped, helped to, 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 to reduce it somehow. But I think one time, if it's really necessary, they would say, okay, the, 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 Europe, the, the, the uh, the euro area cannot, cannot, and the taxpayers of the euro area um, 
cannot, cannot uh, be, be held responsible for the losses in special countries, then I think a one-time wealth tax is definitely a better solution than these bail-ins. But if bail-ins become the rule, I think the life in the euro area will become even more interesting uh, than, than it already is. And of course, the worst thing is, is, this, uh, 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 is, is the bail-in of, of small depositors, which I, one can really, it's really difficult uh, to understand how, how these finance ministers could, could come up with such a solution. That's really, it, it can only be uh, explained maybe by the fact that they decided in, uh, in three, three o'clock in the morning or so. But even then one can ask, why do they take their decisions at three o'clock in the morning? The nice uh, driver who brought me from the airport to this, to this location said, uh, if you have uh, people, uh, pilots in planes, you do not want uh, to have a pilot who has, did not have enough sleep. And why, why do we have decision makers in, in fiscal policies? Why do we expect that, that the decision makers, pol politicians, will find the right decisions uh, if they don't have enough sleep? So I think that's, yes, was a good, good point from him. He had many good points. I said he, he can give the talk if he wants. He <laughs> 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 was, was really, so if, if you want, you can do it. And, he, and he's told me I could use it free of charge. So, I, <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's what I did now. Okay, but that thing, that's also, so, ending with this, um, with this whole list of misperceptions, I think if you want the euro to survive, we really need a U-turn. We need a paradigm change. Continuing like this will lead to a disaster. That's my very strong conviction. If we, if we just continue with uh, austerity policies and uh, now some more bail-ins and, um, no uh, measures which support growth, only hoping the structural reforms will do it. If we have no kind of, of uh, joint and several liability, just hoping that the ECB somehow will do it, I think that that will not lead uh, to, a, to, a good, to, 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 to a happy end of the story. And so we really need, need, this, need this kind of paradigm change. And I think the most important element of the paradigm change is that that uh, politicians um, in Europe uh, will have to wake up and to realize we are all sitting in one boat. It's not that we are sitting in 17 boats. I think that's the German perception. We have the German boat, and if the, if the boat from Cyprus is sinking, maybe too bad for them, but it does not affect us. And I think that's, I think we only want to we'll overcome the crisis if we realize it's one boat, and, um, and, uh, we, have, we need joint efforts. Everybody has to contribute to rescuing, to bringing the boat through the storm. And if this perception is not there, uh, it's, it will be a very, very difficult time. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>